On October 3rd, 2009, an estimated 300 enemy insurgents attacked the remote combat outpost Keating in the remote mountains of Afghanistan. Keating was manned by soldiers of Bravo Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry. Heavily outnumbered, the men in Keating fought to maintain control after the insurgents had breached the wire. In total, eight soldiers were killed in action and 22 were wounded during the battle. Numerous books have been written on the battle, including Red Platoon by Clint Romasha, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his courage on October 3rd. I had the chance to sit down with Scott Eastwood, who plays Clint in the new movie, The Outpost, which is based on Jake Tapper's book, The Outpost, an untold story of American valor. Also joining us is Jericho Denman, former Army Ranger, who was a technical advisor on the film. The film is available for download on July 3rd. Also, make sure you check out a Q&A we did with Clint Romasha on Black Rifle Coffee's YouTube channel. This is Free Range American. Welcome to Free Range American. Scott Eastwood, thank you for joining us. This is your first time on the show. And Jericho Denman, back for another round. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, sorry I'm late again. I, my apologies. It's the DMV called. Yeah, sidebar, Scott got trapped at the DMV for a little bit, and um, that's okay. Jericho and I got a chance to catch up a little bit. Yeah, I had, a, I had everything at the top of coronavirus, like Mar on my birthday, actually, uh, March 21st, I got my car broken into, and I got, like, I had everything in my car <laughs> at that time, and... I mean, they took down to, I lost the pink slip of my car because it was in a folder and they ripped it all out. So I'm still trying to like piece back all the things that I lost. I mean, you know, it has been, a, it's been a, it's been really, really tough in the midst of a pandemic to get a lot done. As you can imagine, you know, things like getting my pilot's license, like I can like, it's like every government agency is like shut down. It's like, it's like impossible. You know, it's, it's amazing how, how this affected, it was like just rip like one incident like that could ripple through, you know? Yeah, for sure. And Jericho's out in LA. So one of the, the meccas of what's going on too. Yeah. yeah. Got my deck in my yard and my fucking grill though. So kind of like Alamo'd up and I'm good to go though. <laughs> I bet you are. Yeah, so uh, guys, we're here to uh, kind of discuss the upcoming release of the Outpost film. Scott plays the character of Clint Romasha, and Jericho was a tech advisor on this movie. Uh, Jericho, kind of, you know, for the audience, kind of walk through a tech advisor position, what you kind of do in that role, and some of the other stuff that you've done in the past. Yeah, so um, military tech advisor or consultant, um, depending on how you want to say it. Um, it's widely varying um, depending on the project that you're doing and how much the director wants you involved. Um, for this project, for the outpost, um, I got involved very early, which is a good thing. Um, so, you know, in, in the outpost in particular, kind of it went how, you know, maybe it should in most things, right? So... Um, I had an early look at the screenplay, so I was able to like help with, uh, you know, kind of messing with a lot of the dialogue and things to like get it a little more authentic. Um, and then also um, in the uh, the build of the set, you know, the ordering of wardrobe, the the building of props, and all that stuff. So. Um, in a pre-production role, you're doing that that kind of thing. Props, wardrobe, dialogue in the screenplay. You're also um, starting to block out some of the action. So you're figuring out round counts for ammo and those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, additionally, a big thing that you do in pre-production is uh, hopefully is, is you know, training some of the cast um, that needs it and has healthy ankles. Um, but... <laughs> but uh yeah so it's got it but luckily you know we can probably touch on it a little later a lot of a lot of getting that training down is just getting the cast comfortable holding guns um because uh 
that's a lot of it. It's not necessarily being well trained. It's just looking comfortable holding the thing, which you you hand a, a gun to an actor a lot of times. And it's like you might as well have handed him a fucking rattlesnake, right? So, um, fortunately, Scott had had uh, already done a good amount of training shoots on his own, so it was like not a big deal. It was just a little bit of like a little bit of knocking the rust off for him, and we were good to go. But yeah, and then um, during principal photography and like throughout the production, it's you know blocking out out of action, just like, you know, giving guys little notes and cues during between takes to, to, you know, polish them up a little bit. Um, and then, you know, hitting things that you may have missed during pre-production. Like, you know, there were a couple of scenes in the outpost that guys were interacting with one another and it just wasn't right. You know, the way, um, you know, like a private talk to a squad leader, for instance, um, just, just kind of fixing those little things to make it more authentic. And some of the other films you've worked on in the past include? Uh, so the first thing I did was a limited series called The Long Road Home, which is a Nat Geo limited series um, about uh, the 1st Cavalry Division in Iraq. Um, and then I did a Peter Berg movie called Mile 22, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Ronda Rousey. And then uh, did The Outpost. And then I have... Uh, done some army commercials. Um, and then I've done a couple of other things that are in post-production now that, that aren't out yet that, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it or not. So, um, but yeah, um, I've done like five big productions so far in my like infant career. Right on. And Scott, how did you become a part of this whole thing? Um, it was, it was really Rod Laurie. Um, he, he was, he was pretty hellbent on, uh, casting me as, as Clint Romache. And, uh, he hounded me and we went back and forth multiple times, um, probably a year at least before we started shooting. Um, you know, I wanted to work on the script uh, there were things that I wanted to see, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that he was going to make the kind of movie that, that, you know, I wanted to make. Um, and, and ultimately we worked on so much, uh, you know, I, I, I finally just, you know, I said yes. And, and, uh, we, we embarked on the, on the quest together and I couldn't have been more, more thrilled that we did because, um, everybody that worked on it, um, Rod uh, on down to, you know, you Jericho and, and, and everybody, uh, you know, everybody was, you know, was just incredible. Like sometimes you work on films and they might, they may turn out like a really good film or like a good end product, but you can have like a pretty shitty time. I'm sure Jericho would tell you, like you can have a pretty shitty time working on it because you just have a bunch of shitheads. Um, and, and, and that might be in, you know, in any department or, or whatever, but you have a lot of um, inner turmoil. And I didn't feel like we did now. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I don't want to speak for Jericho, but I didn't feel like we did. I felt like everyone was kind of on the same page and we were all there to, to do the story justice and, and to, and to really like honor all these men. And, um, and I don't know, just, you know, just felt like it was, it, it just, it, it kind of, like I was, when it was over, it was, it was sort of sad to, to see it all end. Yeah. Uh, how had you heard about the battle that happened, you know, prior to getting the stri- script and starting to talk about it? I had heard about it, um, in multiple, in, in multiple ways. I, I, well, I'd heard that there were multiple things like this, um, that happened, um, in Afghanistan, um, cause this wasn't the only one. Um, and then I knew Sony had a project, um, that was about Clint Romache that never came to pass. And I, and then I guess Jake Tapper's book, I, I was probably aware of, and then when it was, you know, adapted into a screenplay, um, I guess it, it sort of, then it became more, yeah, yeah. 
Right on. I'm super curious as to, you know, as you're, you're learning about the stories and the events that, that passed that day, like what was, what was kind of going through your head? What was your initial impressions of that? Just, just, you know, I think asking these people to, to be in, in these situations and these scenarios like you'd be crazy to not think this was not incredibly, um, incredibly dangerous and incredibly short-sighted on, on, a, on a lot of levels, right? I mean, just sort of a shock and awe that that that, that that's the U.S. military. When I think about the U.S. military, I think about you know that is that's something we've done. Uh, with great expertise and, and we have these fail systems in place because of, because of past events that have, have shown us like, Hey, we don't do these. We have these redundancies and we have these things in place that because of the, the these kind of screw ups. And it just felt like, like that was impossibly, how could that have been overlooked in this, in this situation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it leads me into, I wanted to go through and I wanted to to read a couple of excerpts from, from Clint's book. Um, and, you know, starting off, I feel like one of the main characters um, in this story and I can only imagine in the film is cop Keating in general, which as you were just talking about, like it is a conundrum in and of itself. And if you don't know the story, this is kind of, kind of Clint talking about uh, the area that they ended up being in, in Afghanistan. This is uh, from Clint's book, and he says, the location and analyst selected was unacceptable by almost any yardstick you'd care to measure it with. Positioned only 14 miles from the Pakistan border, the site was ensconced in the deep valley of Nuristan's Kamdash district at a spot that resembled the bowl of a toilet. It was surrounded by steep mountains whose summits went as high as 12,000 feet and whose ridgelines would enable any an enemy to pour down fire on an outpost while remaining concealed behind a thick scrim of trees and boulders. To mount an attack, the tail band only needed to scramble along its rat lines. The foot trails lining the backsides of the ridges that the enemy used to bring in supplies and ammunition set up and start shooting directly into the compound. So literally, they had no cover. They're in this toilet bowl. They're completely exposed. And then Clint kind of speaks to his first, he flew in at night and then he, they actually, that night that they first got in, they got attacked while he was sleeping. And I remember he's walking out and getting his first impressions of where they were. And he says, I leaned back and gasped in amazement as I gazed up at the mountain, the mountains and ridgeline shooting into the sky in every direction, steep sided escarpment studded with exposed granite and blanketed with trees that made the trails running through them completely invisible. The placement of the outpost not only made no sense, any, anyone could shoot into the perimeter from almost any position you'd care to imagine, but it violated everything I'd ever been taught. So essentially, these guys were put into a worst case scenario. And so from a, I'm a production standpoint i was kind of curious as to how you guys kind of did that environment well you know uh, jerry you jump in whenever you want um it's a fluid conversation too by the way uh we shot in bulgaria um i think you know the the terrain looked similar it was it was kind of arid at the bottom of that toilet bowl um and what they decided they were going to do was going they were going to use cgi to create the um the ridge line that surrounded it yeah pretty much they um the the actual set was an old uh it was an old quarry. So uh, kind of during, again, like Scott says, in Bulgaria or outside of Sofia, the capital city. So um, 
this rock quarry basically gave us the perfect little like hole because they'd been, you know, in like the old Soviet era, Cold War era, they were using this to like pull, I don't know, granite or whatever out of. So it, it was actually perfect. Um, and there's nowhere in the world that looks like, you know, those, those valleys in Afghanistan, there's nothing like them in the world except for Afghanistan. So, um, yeah, we, we used a lot of like post-production CGI stuff to, to really get that scale of, um, of the mountains there. Because, I mean, you know, like there's mountains in Afghanistan you look up at and you're like, it just doesn't look real. It's, they're so gigantic and, and uh, steep and extreme. Um, so maybe in, you know, maybe when there's world peace, we can make an on location in Afghanistan <laughs> to get the, uh, the exact um, scale of these, these places down. But for, for doing it somewhere else, um, it, was, it was pretty perfect. Um, and then, you know, having a number of guys who had been stationed at the outpost, um, you know, guys who were at the battle, who, who were, you know, in communication with me and with other, other department heads, uh, to, to get this place looking exactly. I mean, I was never at cop Keating, you know, I was in Afghanistan a bunch. I was around there. Um, but I did different things. But when I walked into a couple of these sets, it was, it was weird, right? Like the, their talk on, on the camp, it looked like a talk in Afghanistan. It was like, it smelled the same. It, it, like everything about it, you know, was, was, was spot on. So it, it was, it was pretty impressive what, um, the people were able to do and, and kind of with what, what Scott was saying about, you know, usually you do a movie like you do, people are like, it's their job. You know what I mean? And they, they show up to do their job. But with this, people realized it was a little bit more right? There was, there was not a little bit, but it was more, it was like, Hey, it's important that I get these things right. Um, because we're, you know, we're memorializing a lot of people here. So everyone was great. Yeah. There's hiccups. People are people, but at the end of the day, everyone wanted to go that extra step to, to get things right. Jericho, did you burn trash on set to give them that like truly authentic feel? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if the, the EPA will be happy about the uh, way we got. To- <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, there is, you know, a lot. I think we didn't burn real poop, but uh, other than that, everything was pretty authentic. And yeah, we were uh, down, down to pretty much, pretty Nat's ass detail. Yeah, I, I can totally see you doing that to the, the entire cast, just trolling them and going around and burning trash all over the place i told scott i told rod that we should have actually made one of the latrines real and made and like actually really burn human shit with diesel and jp8 so that the guys in the stereo yeah. could like an authentic reaction wow glad we didn't do that <laughs> did, you, did you guys have uh did you guys have authentic uh piss tubes on there uh there were piss tubes, but they were not uh, utilized. Oh, shucks. <laughs> uh, but I'm really glad because piss tubes are disgusting, and I didn't want to go to work every day on a set with real piss tubes. <laughs> Nobody wants to smell ammonia. We did a lot of peeing outside. A lot of peeing outside, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Jerry, you, Co, you kind of took a little stab at Scott there with the, the whole ankle thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's the story behind that? Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's a, it's one hell of a way to start a movie uh, with a broken ankle. Uh, oh. That's a first. That's a first. Uh, I think it was, I think it was five or six weeks um, before we were about to start principal photography. It's like six weeks out, five or six weeks out. And I broke my ankle, had surgery within 
24 hours, had two screws put in it. And I called my agent like after the surgery, maybe like as I was going, going in to like get the x-ray, but I already knew, like I knew it was broken. I couldn't walk on it. And I remember saying, I, uh, I just broke my ankle. And he's like, no, he's like, he didn't break it. He, he tries to tell me like via phone that I'm fine and it's going to be okay. And like, he had, like, he's not looking at my ankle. He has no idea. <laughs> so, so Hollywood, he's telling me it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I broke my fucking ankle and I'm going to need surgery probably. And I got the surgery within 24 hours and they told me, like the doctor told me, he's like, you're, you're going to need like, like eight weeks minimum before you need, like can put like weight on it. You know, yeah. you, you got to take four weeks, whatever. And then we'll start doing physical therapy and blah, 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 blah. And I remember like calling Rod and, and telling him and being like, and he, he's being like, well, he's like, and I'm like, but don't worry. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready to go. And there was like five, at that point it was five weeks. And I knew there was three weeks like of disparity there. I was like, I am so fucked. (laughs) I'm so (laughs) not going to make this movie in fucking five weeks. And this was after they had pushed it. This is like, they're like, okay, like we'll push it two weeks. We'll get, we'll get you your, you know, your, 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 uh, your, your five weeks and whatever. And, um, I don't know. I showed up, I showed up and I was still in one of those little scooters where you put your (laughs) knee on it. And that was like day one. Like I was still in that, like I couldn't even put, put weight on my ankle. So they had to, I mean, it really kind of probably fucked Rod's whole design for the, the initial, you know, the stuff we shot in the first several weeks of the movie, because I know he wanted to shoot terribly. He wanted to shoot a lot of these shots as wonders and, and keep them fluid and moving and um, design these really sort of complex shots. Um, and he had to, he had to change a lot of that to accommodate, you know, because the first, what was it? Th- two or three weeks. I mean, I, I really couldn't, I couldn't walk on it. You know, I was standing and I, I remember I was, I was, I was, what? I was already there when, when I think I might've been in the room when Rod got the call. I don't know. Um, I would like to thank you though, because I took a week uh, and went to Greece <laughs> went to where I lived when I was a kid. And I was like, yeah, thanks Scott Eastwood. I hadn't met you yet, but uh, my partner Ray had, had knew some guys who had worked with you. You remember Ray? And uh, I was like, there ain't no fucking way he's going to be good. He broke his ankle. Well, he ain't going to be good. And uh, Ray was like, ah, I think he's got like a little grit. I think he'll be all right. I think he'll do it. And I was like, mm, whatever, I'm going to go to Greece. <laughs> and so, but yeah. And then, I mean, you know I me, mean? I don't like give compliments out, but like, I was like, holy fuck. He's like, got this fresh of a broken ankle and he's doing this. Like, it's pretty, it was pretty fucking impressive. I was like, that must fucking hurt. And you would have like your, between between takes, Scott had like a fucking ice bucket and he would like stick his ankle in the ice to like hold the swelling down from all the shit that had happened for like all the activity that he shouldn't have been doing prior to that. To like, you know, damage control it. And also, you know, we were like, you know, I was on a set, I was in Bulgaria, I'm like drinking beers every night, and, you know, having a good time. But like, he had to be, you know, he had his, his buddy Scott there, uh, Scott, M big Scott, um, Scott. Who was helping him take care of it. And he's like, no, like you don't drink beer. You're, you're going to drink like juice and you're going to like eat right. And you're doing all this shit to like keep the inflammation in your ankle down. You have a fucking like, and that sucks. You're not really getting to enjoy yourself much here. Are you? <laughs> it was a, uh, it was a rough go of it. In the beginning, I had a uh, two Bulgarian um, physical therapist who, who spoke, three words of English. Um, and they would come to, uh, the hotel room at like either 5 AM from like five to six, right before we got picked up in the morning, every morning. 
or they'd come in the evening, depending on, on how early we had to be there. Um, and they, they grind my foot for an hour and make me do all kinds of terrible things, um, to get, you know, me back and working because I had to do all this physical therapy, um, at the same time, which actually was probably like sort of a blessing because I did probably more physical therapy than anyone ever does on a broken ankle. You know, like you, you do your act, you're supposed to do your exercises, you're supposed to do your stuff, but you may or may not do, you know, all of it. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I think I probably, I probably had, you know, because I was so disciplined through the whole thing and I, I wasn't going out and I wasn't, I wasn't really having any fun <laughs> with you guys um, that, you know, it turned out pretty good, but it was a, uh, it was, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. So did you do the whole movie with the screws in? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah, screws, are, screws are still in. Um, Perfect thing to have happen when you have to literally sprint for most of a movie with a kit on. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it was, that was interesting. I, by the end though, I was running, right? I mean, by the end I was running like the last two weeks, I was, you know, I was running around and, and, you know, I was in a tennis shoe and yeah, it was nuts. Scott, did you have to do any other, uh, training at all when it, when it came to kind of the technical aspects with the firearms and, and kind of movements at all? Well, so I, you know, in, in, in breaking my ankle and, and not, you know, going out there and, and not having everything be on schedule in turn, I sort of missed boot camp um, because of, because of this broken ankle. Um, but, you know, I was lucky. I, I had done uh, a few boot camps before and I'd done, you know, some weapon systems training and um, you know, I'd done a lot of that training before as I, I'd uh, you know, played some, some sort of um, special, you know, operators and, and other films and stuff. So I had, I had sort of, you know, what I thought was the basics at least. Yeah. For everybody's agent who's watching, this is not a free pass to say you're. <laughs> <laughs> Jericho, it's did you run that boot camp? <laughs> Money. Did you run that boot camp that the rest of the cast went through? Yeah. Yeah, I did. And it, it was like, you know, like the fourth or fifth one I'd run for, a, um, for a movie or a, a show. And, you know, with, with every time you do everything I've done, every time you run a boot camp or any kind of training, there's going to be people who can't be there. Um, and that's just part of the job. And, and, you know, Scott fortunately had a, a, a background that, again, it's just not being scared is, is a lot of it. And then, you know, we were able to block the stuff out, you know, before, before the, before the day, you know, like go through and like, Hey, get here and, you know, making it look good. Like he already had the base there. So, um, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of the other guys had a pretty, they had a little bit of turbulence to boot camp um it was the first one that i did um a lot of the cast were from the uk right so not only are they thespians but they're also not american right so you know even americans who didn't grow up with guns knew someone who had um so it became a lot bigger of a thing than i thought it was going to be yeah. um just getting them comfortable um and then additionally, you know, just a lot of like cultural stuff. Like there's, there were guys there, you know, normally when I train either, either train someone like in the, in the tactical space or, you know, when I was in the army or training, uh, cast members, I always go back to like, the first thing I do is like their stance, like, all right, what sport did you play? Okay. You played tennis. Remember what your stance, like, and build from there. And a lot of these kids were, they were Brits that like, what sports did you play? Uh, I didn't play sports. I'm an actor. So like, like, all right, sweet. <laughs> Me and I right, literally had to teach a lot of these guys, like, how to, not kidding, like, and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from these guys. They were great actors. Um, they just didn't have these experiences that you grow up in the United States having. Um, so, like, 
we had to teach them how to run. Like, because wow. they, they looked goofy when they ran, you know? So like we had to teach them how to run properly, teach them how to like get in an athletics dance, uh, do all these things. So I, I fragged or, you know, changed my plan quite a bit after the first couple days. I went in with a plan and then was like, holy fuck, this ain't going to work. Um, but yeah, it was, it was still cool. And, and the guys like really got out a lot, a lot out of it by the end. It's funny for a guy who has trained probably thousands of soldiers at this point, <laughs> gets yeah. actors and is like, fuck this plan. <laughs> We're shooting it from the hip. <laughs> I'm like, this morning for the first hour, we're going to practice running. <laughs> you know, uh, on the schedule I had, you know, load, fire, reduce stoppage on a saw, but instead we're going to learn how to run. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get to the mechanics of the, the belt fed automatic weapon later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to cover for a little bit. It's cool. Yeah. But you know what, to, to, to your credit, man, I mean, you did an incredible job. Like, and I think all the guys really ended up looking uh, really good. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a testament of both you and your hard work and, 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 not, and not taking, you know, satisfactory uh, for good enough always like demanding perfection. And then the, all the guys like wanting to be the best they could. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to give Rod a lot of credit in the, the boot camp experience as well. Rod Glory was our director and he didn't even tell me this until after, and I won't name names, but there were a number of, uh, a number of voluntary withdrawals from boot camp. <laughs> and, really? uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, one, one kid in particular showed up to him like in tears. Yeah. I can't take it, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> and Rod, if you know Rod Lurie, he's a sweetheart. He's like the nicest guy on earth. And he told me about this after we had wrapped that he said, okay, that's fine. You don't have to do the rest of boot camp. And the kid's like, oh, okay, thank you. He's like, I'll just recast you. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I love to hear that. Yeah. And, and the kid came back and he, and he got through it and he was awesome. Like he ended up getting it, you know, and he'll probably be a better person for it for the, you know, kind of the rest of his life. Uh, and it's funny, you know, when I, I tell the, the cast too, and I do those things, like I play this like horrible person. I make the cast hate my guts. Like I do it on, I do it on purpose. Um, do you like it a little? Yeah, and then I, I mean, yeah, I like a little, it's like a little weird fetch. <laughs> and then uh, by the end, you know, then I start to, you know, like a couple of days out. It's just like they did in the military. When you go to base yeah. training, crushed, and then at the end, they tell you you're like the world's best trained killer, you know? So it's, it's, it's not anything earth shattering or groundbreaking. Uh, but when you do it to people who have never experienced it before, had, had that happen to them, they're like, you know, yeah. after then, you know, once, Principal photography starts, and I'm like, "All right, guys, now I'm here for you. Now, now I'm your friend." You know, and they're like, "What? Oh, fuck. Okay." <laughs> Psychologically, like warfare. Yeah, they're like, "What? Now he's my friend? I don't get it." Yeah, because I'm I'm sure as you're going through boot camp, they're like, I, "I'm not going to be able to spend you know months of filming with like listening to this guy. This is going to be awful." Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they. they <laughs> they're gonna have a good time. All right. So, you know, kind of get into, um, you know, kind of the, the actual battle here a little bit, um, you know, based off of, you know, kind of describing cop Keating and, you know, the, the worst case scenario for a place that you could be in Afghanistan, essentially like on top of that, what's the worst case scenario that could happen from an action standpoint on that specific location. So just so you can kind of get a little bit of ambiance about what it would be like to be in that scenario. Uh, this is an, another excerpt from Clint's book where he, he talks about that moment and it was just af just after dusk when uh, the Taliban attacked and he kind of goes through and describes what it was like to be in that situation. 
He says, the mountains surrounding Keating erupted in flames. Along the ridgeline and across the hillsides, concealed behind rocks, trees, as well as the buildings of Vermeil, roughly 300 insurgents opened up with everything they had. RPGs, AK-47s, B-10 recoilless rifles, Russian 82 millimeter mortars, sniper rifles, and powerful anti-aircraft machine guns known as dishkas. Whatever arms the Taliban recruits had managed to scrounge from the surrounding villages, purchase on the black markets of Nuristan, or haul in across the mountain passes from Pakistan, we were now being brought to bear with shocking effect directly on Keating. He says, as if someone had seized hold of a fold in the sky, ripped a hole in the thing, and was now dumping all the ordnance and munitions in eastern Afghanistan directly on top of it. Which, you know, it kind of gives me the goose pumples to, like, think about what that would be like. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, so how, how do you guys, how do you put people in that mindset from, from a filming standpoint? Um, both as an effect and in that emotional headspace. So for for me, the the kind of the, the culmination exercise of uh, the boot camp, and then I did it a little bit throughout, um, depending on what scene was going where. Um, I grabbed uh, some of the stunt guys who, who knew a little bit of stuff. And then I had Ray, my partner, and then also my brother came out to do uh, the boot camp. And we basically played insurgents for like the last half of the day. And we're like, hey, just move around the camp. And then we went up and, you know, there was a little bit of a hill above, above the set. And we just, up there, we just, we just shot at them all day. We're like, <laughs> you know, like the blanks or whatever, but you know, get from one end of the camp to the other, see if you can do it. And, and we just like ran around, just like making their life suck to kind of give them that, uh, holy shit. Like this place was fucked. Like there was nowhere. I, they were like, there's nowhere I could go. How did these guys do this? Like, exactly. So that's kind of like the thing I did to try and put that into the, these, these dudes heads, um, going into it as best I could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you sort of distill down what that feeling must have been like in words? I, you know, it's, it's monumentous, you know, it's, um, it's something like, I don't even know if you, if you could, ever um recreate or or really truly feel the the fear and the the maybe even a helplessness at at times but at the same time you know um the the will to survive and to um and to to not give up i mean it's uh it's incredible and that's why the story is what it is and i i don't know how i specifically got there uh emotionally or understood um that i mean a lot of a lot of long conversations with um with with the guys who who, who were there who worked on the film um, a lot of conversations with um, with people that were in, in similar, uh, you know, similar circumstances, and and just trying to just trying to get a little grasp of what that would have been like, um, you know, and then and then you have to you know find find things I guess in your own past or whatever that that can that can make you feel. Um, an inkling of, of what that might've felt like. So you can, you can, you can tell that to the camera. Sure. Yeah. It's not a, not an easy task. I'm sure. Um, from kind of a technical standpoint, when it comes to, you know, you've got RPG explosions, um, various types of rifles and, and firearms. Um, Jericho, what, like what, what were, tell me about some of the stuff on set as far as like kind of, actual practical effects that you 
Yeah. So, I mean, anytime you're doing more stuff, I always kind of prefer practical effects uh, over, you know, effects after, after the fact is, you know, it helps, it helps guys like Scott get in the moment and, and all that for sure. Um, but I also think they look better, but, um, the thing with, with practical is, and especially with, uh, the way Rod shot this movie, which was in mostly oneers, um, all the scenes are one continuous shot, you know? So there, there were scenes where you have, you know, a hundred practical effects going off, you know? So that's a lot of, um, a lot of reset and a lot of setup. Um, so yeah, we, we had, you know, the, the RPG explosions were, you know, just like air with a little bit of propane and like, you know, uh, cork and sand and styrofoam and all that, like kind of normal movie magic stuff. Um, you have guys with paintball guns that shoot, you know, uh, like a dust paintball instead of a regular paintball. It like looks like round impacts. But um, for this, just to try and like let that volume of fire sink in, it was really, it was, it was challenging to, to get all that in um, and give that, really give that feeling that there was like this, like, like Clint describes this like shower of, of fire pouring in. Um, it was very, very challenging. And it, the, the special effects guys were, you know, it's like 10 dudes out there with paintball guns shooting these like dust things. And then it's also like, all right, but we also can't shoot the, can't actually shoot the people in the scene because, you know, whatever. So yeah, it, it was a, it was a big undertaking to get that, um, to get it like practically done. And then also they added in a good amount of, uh, VFX after the fact too. I don't remember if it was in, if it was in, Red Platoon now, or if it was in uh, uh, Jake's book, but I remember hearing. I remember it was it was a quote. And I imagine it was from Red Platoon because it was. Well, I think it was first person. It was Clint speaking, and it was just talking about the, sh- the the amount of firepower and and how loud it was for so long, and it was so sustained. Like it gave me. I remember reading it. Give me. It gave me goosebumps thinking about just ha- th- that amount of pressure for so long, you know, I mean, as you know, and we've talked about Jericho, like when you came, when you had, you know, when you got in contact situations, they would be abrupt and then go away. Right. Like having this, that much contact for 12 to 24 hours. I mean, it's just, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and on top of that, the amount of firepower and, and how loud those weapons are, you're you're in a fishbowl. So everything audio wise is echoing and bouncing off. So it's probably I'm sure there was a kind of amplitude to to everything on, on top of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott, is there anything that kind of sticks out to you as far as uh, <clears throat> situations um, kind of? you know, you come to mind, uh, throughout the process of filming any certain scenes or, or anything like that. Yeah. Well, there's a few, um, I don't want to give away too much. Um, I mean, some of the, some of the stuff is sort of story, and, and character driven, um, that I thought were well done. Um, trying to think without giving away, without giving away too much, you know, there, it's just, I think more than just a, Oh, it's, if we're talking about special effects there, there, there was in, and keep it sort of in, in that, um, I think, and I can't remember where it was. It was, it was at the talk and it was sort of this moment where we're remobilizing and strategizing about how we are going to um, apply force 
with force and, and kind of come back to, to regain our foothold. Um, and, and that scene was, was a, was a, one of the, one of the more memorable scenes I had, at least as far as a, a special effects, um, there was a, uh, a mortar that came in through the roof during that, during that, um, that scenario. And the, the reset and the, the special effects there were, were very practical and it, 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 it was so real in times I thought something when we were filming went wrong <laughs> where I was, I, my heart skipped a beat a couple times where I thought, Oh my God, it blew too big and the roof is collapsing. And so it really makes, I mean, those kind of things are, are stuff you, you dream, you dream for as, as an actor, right? Because you're just reacting at that point. You're not, you're completely out of your, your head and, and, and what you're, you know, you're, you're just, you're in the moment. And those, those, there were, there were a couple, but that was one that I remember uh, pretty vividly in, in thinking, oh, I, I remember actually the thought, the thought in my head was, oh, fuck, this Bulgarian production fucked up. <laughs> now I'm going to die. <laughs> but it wasn't. And it just was, was, I think, a lot bigger than maybe they had expected. Um, and it was, it, was, uh, it was great, you know, and I hope, I, hope, I hope that kind of stuff shows through the film. Um, yeah. um, or go ahead, Jerko. Yeah, and that was another thing that was kind of cool about how we shot the movie in order, right? So, I mean, 95% of it we shot in order. So as the battle raged on and as things happened, like we were destroying the set. Because when day one we showed up, it was like, it looked like a, it looked like a combat outpost that hadn't been blown up. And then as, as we wore on, there was, you know, more bullet strikes, more, more uh, recoilless rifle impacts, all these things. Like we really blew up some of these buildings, you know? So yeah. Uh, and then <laughs> that probably wasn't a, you know, when, when Scott had the like, Oh shit, did they, did they screw up? Like, probably a pretty normal reaction to have there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Scott, I'm super glad you think, at least I think it's the same scene in my head, but it was, it was that situation in the, in the talk, it, which I felt like was a really big shift in, in the overall events that happened that, that day, because leading up to that point, like these guys were just getting their shit pushed in for, for hours and they were just getting attacked for a very long time and they had a conversation which basically entailed like hey are we gonna sit back and continue to take this and like take an alamo approach to the situation or are we going to fucking attack these guys and, and like shift the narrative what's of what was going on and you can you can really tell from a tonality perspective that everything changed after that moment yeah. And I think that was, I think that Rod, that was his, um, you know, that was what he, he had his strive for, uh, to make you feel and have that be a real turning point where it, it, it felt like the tide had receded and, and, and things were, um, we were going to move forward. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that is, I think it's really it's strong for the story. It is also true to what happened. So that was, like, I mean, this is an incredible story because, you know, you, you'd write, like, if you're writing the screenplay and you're writing a fictitious story, you'd, you'd almost, you'd have that moment you'd have that device, right. To, to continue your story, to have your protagonist and your, you have, you know, to like win and, and, and win the battle and, and the whole thing, you'd have this tr tide turning, but this is what really happens. So it's just a, an unreal story. Yeah. I feel like if this story ever came across in script form from, you know, whoever looked at this would be like, this is fucking garbage. Like this would never happen. You know, like there's no way that this is, you know, a possibility. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. Like the, you know, and I'm, I think I was talking to Logan about this earlier, Scott, like 
other things like me and Ray have done that are true stories, when people watch it, they're like, oh, that's bullshit. And you're like, no, no, no. Like, that wasn't a mistake. That really happened. And people think, like, this is so, this is such an amazing, crazy story that it must be Hollywood embellishing it. It's like, you know, that really happened. Yeah. What, what were we talking about yesterday, Jericho? It was like, uh, you saw some guy just firing his pistol at the mountain and you were like, why are you doing that? And then you, you so talked to Ray. Yeah. Uh, you, Scott, you remember D-Rod? Yeah. There he is. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the, the screenplay, like he's running from, you know, the, the talk to his, his mortar position and they're like, yeah. And he fires. I was like, he wouldn't fuck shoot his pistol. Fuck. <laughs> How would he do that? And then, he gets there and I'm like, hey man, you want like an M4 here or something? Because like it has you. He's like, no, 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 I really did that. I was like, oh fuck, okay. <laughs> so, and what did he say when you asked him why you, he did that in the moment? Just wanted to feel like he was doing something. You yeah. know, he's pissed off and like he's getting shot at. Like, you know, it's better than nothing. <laughs> you know, basically. So, wow. Yeah, because we were talking about that yesterday. It's just, it's like when you're in that situation and it is it is such a unicorn of a situation. Like you don't know what you're, how you're going to react as a human, you know? So like it probably made a ton of sense for him to just take out his nine mil and just clack off a mag because it's probably, it's better than doing nothing in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, also along the lines of um, kind of the story development is, um, later in the fight, the amount of aircraft that ended up being used uh, throughout this fight. So I was kind of curious how you guys, um, from a production standpoint, weave that in as far as like you had A-10s, you had Apaches, you had F-15s, you had Blackhawks, you had bombers. Like, did you guys, were you able to include some some of these elements in the, the filming? It's all VFX. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's part that was part of you know Scott can probably touch on it better, but it, it's part of the you know the the storytelling aspect of it too was like we didn't want to see a lot of that stuff around for a while, you know, and really like let the, let let these guys fight their fight and and let that really sink in that, that they were all alone, you know, for a while. But Scott can. Yeah, no, I think that was I think you're you're hundred percent right, uh, and I remember you know that being that being something we talked about uh at least rod and i and just just that feeling of being in a fishbowl and and no no cutaways to to you know air support that would make you feel like um you know we're we're in the fight and and you know the good guys are coming and we're you know we're getting back up i, I think the the feeling of 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 all alone and that isolation and not knowing if they were going to be able to get in and, and come in and win and how quick um, there was a lot of complications with air support during that day uh, from what I remember um, in this, in the story. And um, that is why, you know, even it, you know, it was, it was far from, was it, um, what was the, what was the um, Jericho remind me the name of the, um, of the base where they had flight operations uh, Bog coming. Bog yeah, yeah. Bostic. Bog Bog yeah. And also, uh, Bog Bog Bostic. 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 Yeah. Like, like the nearest fob. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that was, that was far. Um, and it was just, it was just, it was really complicated. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. It, it, even for us, like telling the story, um, we were, I think near the, cause we did shoot it in, in chronological order by the end. Um, I almost forgot that there was air support. I like, I had forgotten, um, that, that, that was somewhat one of the very last things to come in and, and really help after this long battle. Um, and, and so when I had to ultimately call in, um, I was like, Oh, Oh, this is, this happened. Like, so late in the game it was it, it was it was almost a surprise to me at that point because it, it, we, we had spent so much time without that 
as a, as a story in, in the telling of the story and, and, and actually what we were doing while shooting it. It's pretty interesting. And then having, you know, it is, it is interesting, I guess, having it all be done VFX. Um, not my favorite. Um, it, it, it does. I think there is something that you get from seeing uh, like real practicals and, and, and real, real um, in, in this case, we, we didn't have, we only really had like, I guess one opportunity where we would have, where I guess it was at night where we would have had, we could have had a real helicopter come in and, and, you know, either drop us off and, and, and shoot some of that. But we decided to sort of Hollywood that and cheat that a little bit. Um, you know, it's, um, it, it is what it is. It's, you know, you're sort of, you have to do what you, what you do in this case. A lot of it was done uh, VFX. Um, but it, it does give something when you're, when you're doing these things and there is more practical uh, element from at least from air support it it makes it real because uh, you know as you know helicopters and planes are loud they they come in fast it's um you know it, it's dangerous when they come in when when, when airplanes or, or helicopters come, you know when helicopters come in uh it's dangerous when they come into land like that's a that's a dangerous time that's that's like a moment um that stuff can go really wrong um, i you know as a pilot i know that um and so that's like, that's a real critical time. And I think it, it sort of, it ups the, it ups the stakes a little bit for filming um, when you have, when you have practicals come in like that. But, um, you know, we faked it and we, we, I think we, we, we did a really good job. I was actually pretty impressed seeing, seeing some of the, the VFX, the final VFX stuff in the trailer. I haven't even actually seen a final, a final final. I've seen a, a couple cuts now, but, um, I saw it was with with uh, with no VFX, and I'm interested to see what all those VFX looked like because they actually look pretty damn good in the trailer. Yeah. Some of the cheese and stuff coming through, I, I know that shot that looked that looked pretty good. I was impressed. Yeah, yeah. Jericho, did you get a chance to watch the the final? Yeah, yeah. I'm more important than Scott, so I, I got. The- <laughs> um. No, yeah, I, I've seen it a, a number of times now. And yeah, the, the amount of work and stuff that goes into those VFX, I mean, just I, I, I got to work a lot in the post-production stuff. It's really hard. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how hard it is to get that shit right and, and how time-consuming and, and all that. Yeah, but um, I think Rod's, you know, the director's like vision was to really like concentrate on the guys in the bowl, you know, the guys in uh, and and not, not, you know, kind of like Michael man it up, you know, and make it this big, like huge explosion thing. It's like about these people in there and, and, you know, tight in on them and their experiences rather than, you know, going up and doing this crazy drone shot of a stack of like, you know, every different aerial platform that was coming to bear that day. Um, that's not what, that's not really the story that we were aiming to tell. It was, it was about, you know, Romache and Carter and, and the rest of the platoons that are out there um, and, and their individual stories and, and their experience, not the big, sexy, huge explosion, fighter jet, bomber, gunship thing. Right. And Jericho, you, you know, having the experience you did in the military and, and walking through the, the making of this are, are you happy with kind of the the portrayal of everything on that front yeah yeah i mean uh absolutely. i know you told me there was one incident where you you had yeah. you had a yeah, brief yeah. i've already told i've already told the you know the director and the producers there's there's one thing i'm not going to defend in the tech <laughs> advisor. um and that is god it's big scott called you sarge in one scene and uh, <laughs> You know, like, and it, what it's funny, like I say it tongue in cheek, but what people are, you know, that haven't been uh, on a production, like we were shooting these wonders, like it was a, it was a, this scene was like a lot of dialogue between a lot of guys, you know, and, you know, the best take, one guy called Roma Say Sarge <laughs> at one point. So it's like, shit. You know, and I remember after that take, I was like, hey, don't say Sarge, say Sergeant. He's like, ah, oh, fuck yeah, I forgot. 
but then, that was the one take that they used was when he's yeah yeah and it's you know nature's a beat you know i've called people sarge before just you know in in jest but i know that like the haters are going to come out of the fucking woodwork on that one so um <laughs> i mean if that's the only thing uh, you know yeah yeah, I'll yeah. Let, i think we can let that slide yeah but um yeah as far as getting the feel like i i was very very happy at how it the action and all that stuff great you know like the guys look good shooting and and all that great but i think the thing that i really liked that it it brought across was like the 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 family feel of this platoon and these and these guys together um and they cared about each other you know um I, I don't know that we've seen that very much in very many contemporary war films. So. And, and also that it's, it's portraying, you know, uh, a cab unit. It's a conventional army unit. We're so used to being inundated with these like green beret seal ranger, you know, yeah. Yeah. And it's the, the general purpose force that was out there with their ass in the grass every day, getting no glory whatsoever. Um, so I'm really happy that, that there's a thing that's going to tell their story in Afghanistan um, and, and get, you know, the people that were there, they can take their kids or their, or their parents or whatever to see this movie and be like, I wasn't there, but that's kind of what I did. You know, um, that, that was important to me. And I'm, I'm very happy with what, that, what, what happened in that regard. I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. I mean, that's, I think, one of the, the biggest reasons I, I ultimately wanted to do this is just like not, not to take away from any other, you know, special forces movies that have been out there as of recent. And I know that, you know, been really popular, um, but it was, it was, I think really important to see, you know, everyday people in extraordinary circumstances, you know, and doing extraordinary things. Um, like I think about, I think about that, this, that, that, the old, the old quote, you know, um, you know, when, when, uh, when uncommon, when is it uncommon valor was, was a common virtue and just like the, just, just, you know, not, not, not being, you know, there's people that had, you know, everyday lives that, 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 that all they want, you know, to do is, is get home and see their, see their family and serve their country. And just being put in this, in this situation, just is, it's, it's un, it's unfathomable to me. Well, I, uh, you know, I don't want to give away too much of this story cause it's, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty incredible to watch it through. Um, what what's the the release plan for this bad boy? We're um about a month out from from launch, yeah. I think a month today, right? A month, less than a month, right? But July yeah, three, July third. All right, so guys, July third is the on demand release of the Outpost. Guys, where can we find you? At? Jer- Jericho. Uh- so my, uh, my work is uh, at War Office Productions or WarOfficeProductions.com. And then I, my personal is at Laidback Berserker um, on the gram. On the gram with that stash, that porn stash you got going on. Look at that thing. The beautiful stash. Diversifying, man. It's a, uh, it's a half animal bar. Why don't you, why don't you let it go all the way? Um, I don't know. It's just, I, I didn't think about it. Well, while we were waiting for you to jump on, Scott, he, um, what, what was the term you, you said you looked like out there in LA, Jericho? Oh, I look like one of those really tough gay dudes. <laughs> <laughs> the gay dude that like, goes around beating the shit out of dudes for calling them gay, you know, or calling them gay. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Got that vibe going, which isn't, I don't hate it. I'll, I'll embrace it. Cool. Yeah, I like it. So were you asking where, where we can find us or find the movie? I find you. Where are you at on social media and whatnot? On social media. You know, I'm, I'm on the gram, Scott Eastwood. I'm on Facebook, Scott Eastwood. Um, but you can find me in Texas, man. I'm deep in the heart of Texas. Um, so you come down to Austin, you keep your eyes peeled. <laughs>
All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining this episode of Free Range American. Can't wait for this movie, guys. Thank you for having us.